Welcome. Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. If you're just tuning in or joining us online, we welcome you and thank you for joining us virtually. Let me open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, and we praise you. Thank you for the blessed hope you give, Lord, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, you have sent your Son to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. We are absolutely and completely forgiven in him. We are redeemed, blessed beyond measure, given a place in the kingdom of heaven, an eternal home. So, Father, we just come before you today thanking you and praising your name, rejoicing in the fact that you're able to heal us, save us, and change our lives, and then, Father, to use us as vessels for your glory so that others can be healed, changed, and saved. So, God, it is the most wonderful blessing that any human being could ever ask for. And today, we just want to say thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Okay. There we go. Thank you, church. Today we'll be in 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 10. Again, we're going to return to this scripture. The gospel of grace calls, um, part two, if you will. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. We are joyful to have you with us, and we thank God for you, and we welcome you in Christ's love. We're riding out a wave of blessing coming from Easter Sunday, the resurrection power that God offers us um, is flowing freely through our church, through our lives, and through our hearts. And uh, just knowing that God showed us his tremendous love for all mankind when he sent his son to die on the cross and conquer sin and death once and for all. We're just reveling in the authority that Christ has given us and the power that he has uh, bestowed on us and the fact that he has chosen us and saved us and called us his very own. It is a great blessing. I wish it didn't have to end, but uh, Resurrection Sunday comes once a year, and it is a tremendous wave of power and blessing. It is the will of God that each and every believer in Christ takes hold of the life that is freely given to him or her. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, we talked last week, he lovingly encourages us he encourages us through his word, through our hearts, through peace, through the very words that are spoken. He warms our hearts. He blesses us. He welcomes us. At the same time, he's empowering us with all power, all the power that we need. This power is fully supplied through the gospel of grace. It's the message that we hear. And this message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the foundation of the Christian family and the Christian life. It is the foundation of salvation. As we embrace the gospel, God calls us in. And we, when you answer yes to the gospel, when God says, I would like to call you in to belief, to call you into blessing, to call you into my family. Will you come? And when you purposely, specifically answer yes, you enter into the magnificent blessings and the unlimited resources that God offers. If you happen to miss uh, last week's message, you can go back on the computer on blb.church and you can look up the message from April 7th and I encourage you to go back and see where we started in this series, The Gospel of Grace Calls. Uh, they're kind of going to work together and we're going to work through the scripture. Let's go to 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 10. 
Let's start in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. I think, uh, there we go. Okay, there's a mic problem. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Lord and sa of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I'm going to grab this microphone. I think the batteries may be... Uh... There, I can use this test. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Looking at verse 8. So last week we talked about uh, the spirit of power, love, and discipline. Self-discipline. These are the things that are actually needed. These are things that people who are coming out of darkness into the light need to understand that the power, love, and self-discipline is what drives the Christian life. It's what God gives you to really embolden your answer to the gospel. When you answer yes, this Holy Spirit that is given to you gives you this power, love, and self-discipline. You have to utilize those things. You have to understand them. And the results will be remarkable as you get, give God room to work in your life. Look at verse 8. 2 Timothy 1 verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. The gospel of grace calls believers to take a bold stand for Christ and his message. Notice here that directly after verse 7, where God says he's given you not timidity, but power, love, and discipline. He says the word therefore. It directly applies to the previous verse or verses. Since you've been given such power, a spirit of love that pleases God and serves others, and self-discipline to change your life, the self-discipline to cause the things that happen in your life to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to do the things that you were not able to do before. The Bible says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the gospel, of the testimony of our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Your first act of boldness as a Christian, and I just want to say that a lot of Christians miss this. The Christian body is not responding in the way that is biblical to the boldness that God calls us to. It's something that we really need to study and we need to grab hold of. We are called to boldness in the gospel, and believers are not to be ashamed of the gospel. 
To be ashamed of the gospel is the same as being ashamed of yourself before an ungodly world. However you stand for Jesus is the same as how you now stand for yourself. You've been changed. If you answered yes to the call of the gospel, you've been made new. The power that you've been giving that we talk about here in verse 7, therefore, since you've been given power, love, and self-discipline, you have inherited this from God. It's been implanted in you. Take a look at 1 John 4, 15 through 17. 1 John 4, 15 through 17. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. So if you're as he is, and the Bible says, as Jesus is, so are you, if you've answered the call of the gospel, then when you're ashamed of Jesus and ashamed of his testimony and ashamed of his word, then you're ashamed of yourself. And that can result in a lot of misconceptions and a very weak body of Christ that doesn't understand. Everyone knows, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation unto all who believe. You see, why did he keep saying that? Why did Paul keep saying, I'm not ashamed, don't be ashamed. Therefore, since you've been given these mighty blessings with power, love, and discipline, therefore, do not be ashamed. I say it's because it is a powerful issue that Christians must face and stand up in the world. We are called to boldness in the gospel, and believers are not to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Christ and his gospel are your bold confidence. In the scripture we just read, you see that it says, uh, By this love is perfected with us. In 1 John uh, 4.17, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. That confidence comes from your acceptance of Jesus Christ, from you standing boldly for him. Christ and his gospel are your bold confidence. Let's take a look at Matthew 10, 26 through 33. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. Listen to these verses. Matthew 10, starting in verse 26. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This is a call to boldness. This is a call to stand for Jesus Christ. Our church is set to do that here, to drive home the gospel, to put boldness in each one of us, 
as he is, so are you. Stand firm for the gospel. The foundational fundamentals. It is the gospel that has saved you. Heaven is your home because the very work of the gospel. You see, the Bible doesn't say that anything else is the power of God unto salvation. It says the gospel is the power of God. Amen. Thank you, church. The gospel message is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. You know, Christians have misconceptions. They don't understand the gospel. I confess, after years of being a Christian and sitting in church, you know, at some point in time, I began to realize, like, you hear, sometimes you hear you say, every message should have the gospel in it. And then you hear criticism. You hear any pastor that's not preaching, if he doesn't have the gospel in the message, it's not a real message or it's not the way that it should be done. And so you start thinking, what is this gospel? And as a Christian, I'm willing to bet many of you right now can actually say and say, you know, to really clarify, I never made the gospel number one in my life because I went through this myself a few years ago. So do you know what? The gospel is actually something that I need to know what it is. I need to know how profound it is and what it is, what the message is. The gospel is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Resurrection Sunday, the power of the Holy God coming in you when you answer the call of the gospel. If you don't answer the call of the gospel, heaven is not your home. If you answer the call of the gospel, my son died for you, my son was buried, and my son rose up on the third day, and if you believe in him, you shall be empowered, you shall be saved. If you believe in the gospel, then you are saved. Thank you, church. So know what the gospel is. I confess to you, it changed my life and kind of re-evaluated my thinking when I understood how powerful and how I should look at the gospel message. And did I actually know how to give an answer for the gospel? What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God sent him to die for me. And you need to have a profound memory of that and to know what it is. You will forever be blessed. The second act of boldness, right here in the scripture, number one was do not be ashamed of the gospel. The second one, right here in verse 8, because of God's grace, we are called in the gospel to join in whatever suffering may come. Now you're talking crazy, all right? I want power, I want love, I want discipline, I want discipline to make my life work out. I need that so badly. But now you're telling me I'm called to suffer? One scripture, verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So in the very same sentence, God says, I want you to stand for the gospel greater than anything else in your life, in your whole entire world and your being. You stand for my gospel. And before he finishes the sentence, he says, Oh, and you're called to suffer with me in it. That throws off the Christian church. That doesn't ring well with the Christian church. The Christian church can be soft, misinformed, and sugar-coated with a gospel that doesn't actually ring true. Once you're told about the suffering, you don't have to worry. You don't worry in Jesus Christ. You see the boldness? You have to boldly stand. No wonder why Jesus said, whoever boldly stands for me in this world, I will boldly stand for him before my Father in heaven. Will you boldly stand for Jesus Christ? Will you boldly make him first in your life? Will you give him credence over everything and understand that even the suffering that may come your way is a gift from God? It is a blessing. You just have to overlook it. You have to be strong enough and bold enough to trust in God. The very essence of believing, we'll break this down a little bit. The very essence of believing, there is so much in these verses. For a Christian who believes and answers the call of the gospel 
it automatically links you to persecuted prisoners such as Paul. Paul was in prison. Timothy knew that if he started proclaiming the gospel and sharing the same thing that Paul shared, that he was probably going to be in line to get in some of the same trouble that Paul was in. So Paul's in prison suffering, and he's telling Timothy, you stand for the gospel, and do not worry about what's happening to me. He says right here, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, because I'm in prison suffering, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. The very essence of being a Christian, not only aligning you with persecuted Christians from the onset and the beginning of the church, but also places you in the same likeness as your Lord Jesus Christ. As he is, so are you in this world. You're automatically made in his likeness. If you shrink back from this, if this doesn't suit you, if it's not uh, according to your wishes that you would be bold enough to embrace this, you will suffer the consequences of what would be unbelief or doubt. And nobody wants that for any Christian. That's the last thing you want for tried and true Christians, is to step away from the boldness that God is giving them. Take a look at 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. Again, these verses are powerful. Let him who have ears to hear, hear. Starting in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25. For you have been called for this purpose... Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Amen. Thank you, church. It's a powerful statement of what Jesus has done for you. Can you stand for him? Will you overcome fear, sugar-coated words? Stop taking from Jesus what you want and misunderstanding what he's asking of you, what he's given you. A reality check reminds the bold believer who is actually going to suffer unimaginably. Unimaginably. It's not you. A reality check, thank God, So now I'm standing up for Christ. I don't care what the world says or anybody. He's my Savior. His gospel is the message that saved me. And nothing can take it away. And I do not care what you say about it. I'm standing for the Lord. A reality check reminds the bold believer who is actually going to suffer unimaginably. Philippians 1, 27 to 30. Again, hear the word of God. Philippians 1, 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, 
and now here to be in me. In Paul's case, it was he was imprisoned. Um, you can see in the world today that there is opponents to the gospel. What you believe, they hate. What you believe, they call you intolerant. Because you stand on the word of God, not on the word of man. You follow what God teaches, not what man teaches. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to their destruction and their death. Thank you, church. It leads to their destruction and their death. And you have suddenly become smarter than that, and you no longer give credence to what man says, and you only listen to God. It is essential for Christians to possess a right attitude towards suffering. This attitude is not self-centered, but has great concern for God and the kingdom of his son who is coming in glory, calling us to be with him. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 10. Again, listen to the power of the word of God. 2 Thessalonians Chapter 1, starting in 4 through 10. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed... You are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day... Church, in America, if this is suffering, I don't know how it compares with the suffering that your forefathers suffered. Paul is referring to true persecution. There is persecution around the world. What I see in America is a lot of Christians being fed a sugar-coated gospel. They're okay. No one's persecuting them. And they're just fed this sugar-coated word to make them feel good and they're just carrying on. We should be the ones standing in full authority, in power, not facing this kind of retribution and persecution at this time, which is coming. We have full authority. We have freedom to stand for Christ. Freedom to teach people the power of God. Is it okay to say the suffering in America and the persecution is at a minimum? Yes, it is. It's a well-known fact. In America, this kind of Christian persecution is at a minimum. You are free to reign with Christ, to boldly stand for him, to impact the world, to make a way and set the example for those around the world that need to see strong Christians. Amen? People need to see a world standing on him. A world coming that will not fail. That will not be destroyed. That we are facing glory. And the Bible tells you, please endure this. The message is just no longer be afraid. Don't be afraid of what might happen. Don't let that hold you back. It's a barrier that you have to break. I know intimately what that feels like. You have to break through. It's like breaking through the glass wall. And you have to decide to stand for Christ versus anything else. Do you know how liberating that is? 
Do you know how liberating it is to say, if I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I die for the Lord. Whether I live or die, I'm with the Lord. And you know what? So be it. Amen? Amen. Courage. You will break through and nothing will be impossible for you. Your prayers will be heard. Does the Bible say that if you're in error or that if you have doubt that your prayers are subject not to be answered by God? It does. The Bible says, he who walks away from my word, he who turns his ear away from me, your prayers become insufficient. That's a church that may be uh, proliferated in the world. A sugar-coated gospel. This is your life, your opportunity, your one chance, an opportunity to grasp hold of the power that God is giving you to break the glass wall, stand up for Christ, and truly achieve the things that God has freely given you. This is my prayer and my desire that you will help me to continue that. When you stand for that, I get stronger. When I stand for that, you get stronger. When we get stronger, the world changes. People get saved. Family members see it and they want that. People in destruction, addiction, helplessness, homelessness, people that are embittered, traumatic, traumatized, and can't find their way in life, they see the power that is revealed through you in God and lives get changed. Amen? Amen. That is what happens. You are an important part of God's kingdom. Thirdly, what I consider the greatest act of boldness, knowing in myself what it took. The gospel of grace is calling people to humble themselves and come willingly into the kingdom of Christ. People who are prideful, people who are arrogant, people who will never admit that they made a mistake. Like my own testimony, all my failures, everything that I had done wrong. People will never say, I failed as well. I messed it up. I really destroyed things in my life. Will you come into humility? See, this is the boldest act ever. Because pride is what is killing men and women in our world. To come to the point to say, without God... I am completely lost and I have destroyed everything in my life. I can't do it. Even when I think that I'm right, I know my way is leading to death. I can feel it in my inner self. The boldest act is answering the call of the gospel through God's grace and placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Regardless of the world's hatred of the gospel. It is God's plan to save you and to grant you holiness through your faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and His resurrection, the gospel of grace, is calling you into that life. I know that you're bold. I don't want to come up against many of you. I know how strong you are. I know how able you are to resist and to put me in my place and tell me, Pastor, I don't want to hear that. Pastor, you don't know nothing about me. Will you use that boldness with God and for God and part of God's family? Take the boldness that I know that you have, that if I confronted you, you have no problem putting me in my place. Use that boldness to put God in His place. Amen? Amen? Rightfully first in your life. It is the boldest act that man will ever make. And that's why so many are unable to do that. It is humility. This is God's plan, not ours. It's not you. This is God's imputed holiness. It's not your holiness. He gives it to you freely. You don't have any. This is by God's grace. And it is by His love for us. Not by your grace. Not by your love. It's not of your works. It is purely of God. 
In closing, let's take a look at John 3, 34 through 36. What is the boldest act any human being will ever make? Accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you bold? Will you be bold? If you're listening out there, how bold are you to stand for Christ? Forget about the suffering. God is blessing you beyond measure. John 3, 34 through 36. Starting in verse 34. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. That is the gospel truth. The choice is yours to make. If you're watching out there virtually, will you let it happen? Will you hear the words of God, the truth? Humble yourself and answer the call of the gospel to your salvation. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If not, if you cannot or will not answer the gospel of grace and its call, that you would come into salvation through the Lord's work and none of your own, you remain in a state of rejection, rejecting God's everlasting love given to you through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son. The world needs to hear the truth. If you love someone, see, the world would say, how dare you say that, Pastor? How dare you say, I remain in rejection apart from God forever? You know what truth is? You know what real love is? If you love someone, if you love the world, if you're watching virtually, if you are truly loved, if you want to love the whole entire world, every one of them, sinners, evil, suffering children, every single one of them, to the poorest child suffering in India and starving, if you want to love someone, what do you do? You tell them the, the truth. You tell them the truth. This is love. This is not audacity, speaking out hurtful things. This is love. You read it yourself. This is love. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life because the wrath of God is abiding on Him, on every person in the world the wrath of God is abiding on them. It will be something that thankfully, if you've answered the call, you will never be a part of. You don't want that. And if you love them, you'll stand for the message of the Lord. And you'll gain a boldness. And the suffering will become something that you will forget all about. It won't even come up in your life anymore. If that's you today, if the truth is penetrating your heart, if reality is setting in, maybe something that was spoken here today really hit home and your heart is open. If that's you, you can begin that journey today. Praying with me. The words won't save you. A heart truly following after Jesus Christ and understanding the truth will. That's what saves you. If that's you, we can pray together today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I completely confess my sin before you and my inability to save myself apart from your Son and the gospel of grace. God, I ask you to forgive my sin 
here and now. Wash my sin away and make me clean by your power and by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the gospel, for your son who died for my sin on the cross, and I accept him as my Savior. And I choose to stand for him and to follow him as the Lord of my life. And I accept this, God, and I ask you to forgive me and save me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. If that's you, don't forget, stay in the word. Surround yourself with Christians. Get in a church. You're always invited here. Uh, Sister Yuki will sing us a closing song, and then I'll close in prayer. Hang tight. <laughs>